My special guest today is a former alderman of the Chicago City Council. She served for six four-year terms from 1987 to 2011. Mrs. Helen Sheila, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. I'm doing very well. It's now a pleasant afternoon here in Massachusetts, but I understand it's, it's in the morning right where you yeah. are. I should sh give a shout out to Prexy Nesbitt for getting me in touch with you. I Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I do really want us to uh, talk about uh, the story of Edison Drobo and uh, the Chicago Zanu magazine. Uh, but before we get to do that, I, I've been looking at your CV, I've been looking at your profile, and I've seen that you have had a profound career. As an alderman, you have played a very important role in the development of uh, the 46th ward of uh, the Chicago City Council as you served as a member, as an elected member. Can you just uh, briefly tell us what it means to be an alderman and what your responsibilities were and the major highlights of your achievements during this six, four-year term of your service? Chicago uh, is governed by a city council of 50 aldermen elected from individual wards and, um, and a mayor who uh, is the convener of the council, uh, but runs the executive branch of the city. Uh, so the city, it's 50 aldermen with a very long tradition of um, a political tradition of, of really in, I don't even know how to describe this. Chicago is a history of a machine, um, political machinery that goes back to uh, Rich, Richard J. Daly, first mayor Daly, uh, in the early 19, in the mid 1950s, and he built an operation that was really based on a patronage system um, and a kind of a quid quo pro system. Uh, so I was I really got came to Chicago and, and as an activist and got involved in political activity because it was impossible to do any work in a community, any kind of organizing, without coming head toe to toe with the precinct captains for that ward and the Democratic Party in the ward. Chicago, while we have two parties in the city, two recognized parties as we do throughout the country, uh, Chicago has been for many, many years dominated by the Demo by Democrats and the Democratic Party. So uh, it, was, it was really the Democratic political machinery and their uh, precinct captains in each, it, uh, every ward had multiple precinct captains. That was the locations where you voted. Uh, there were the, the, uh, the precincts where the captains were appointees of, um, of the machine whose responsibility, one primary responsibility was to get the vote in uh, for uh, the alderman, for the mayor, and, um, for the, and, and to make sure that there was support for the different activities they wanted to do. Um, I was really part of an independent movement that challenged that uh, in the city over a course of many years. And, um, when I, and, and so when I became alderman, it was really important for me to prove that and to show how it was that uh, you didn't have to be you had, didn't have to enjoin them in the manipulative cynical dimensions of this machinery in order to be able to serve the people in your ward in fact you really could do much better if you weren't that you could really respond if you were responding directly to people and their needs you could find a way to get through the political morass to do so and in doing so be able to be much more responsive so it was very important for me as an alderman to be able to redefine the role to be one where we were the first line of defense for anyone in the city who had issues with any bureaucracy. We not only, we consider ourselves in my office as bureaucracy busters. Uh, so we didn't, we obviously focused on city bureaucracies, but we dealt with any bureaucracy that people confronted. And because of the history of the machine, Alderman had, I think, uh, out of reality, Ex there was an out of reality kind of expectation that they could mess with you. So it gave me a lot to play with um, in terms of being able to have access to get into and deal with uh, issues that people had with, with virtually any bureaucracy. In addition to that, we had a legislative role, uh, which was to be able to, um, to pass the city budget uh, and to impact um, zoning, use, land uses, zoning, um, and uh, consequently, the, uh, any, many, many, many different things that dealt with the affordability of the city. 
Uh, I also, because we were a city that was so segregated, with such a history of segregation and inequality, and because for me, those things were connected not only to in the city, but to issues in the state, the country, and the world, that I felt it was very important on some occasions to weigh in on national issues that were affecting us, especially when it came, especially when you could connect it to issues in the ward. Uh, which was the case for me with uh, apartheid and um, and the impact of Southern Africa uh, and, and Rhodesia initially um, until it became Zimbabwe on the whole uh, South African region. So uh, before I was alderman, I often, sorry, I often um, was engaged in citywide activities um, that that reflected these concerns that I had, and we uh, I was part of a group that um, also published a magazine called Keep Strong, and the, and uh, was a I, I was part of a cadre of um, white activists who worked under the direction of the Black Panther Party. Um, so we published our own magazine. We sold Black Panther papers. Uh, I learned from um, the Black Panther Party specifically um, and doing some work uh, when I did some work on the paper, uh, how to write international shorts. And we incorporated that into Keep Strong magazine, uh, which came out once a month and um, interviewed people when we had a chance, uh, which is how I got to interview first Hafsa Mawari from uh, from Zanu, and then later on uh, after he he was he, after he left Chicago, uh, uh, Edison Javogo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I sort of took you all around. Sorry. <laughs> you were so determined. Um, you had your first two campaigns. And then uh, with the third one, then you got, then uh, you're able to, you know, elected and to save, which was a pretty, pretty good uh, contribution to the development uh, of the country, to political consciousness, uh, to achieving racial justice, economic uh, and legal justice for the society. But now I, I understand that before saving as an alderman, um, you had already be, become a politically active person. You had already started to make significant contributions even uh, during your youthful days. I saw that um, during your days at uh, Wisconsin Madison, you uh, played a very important role in the campaigns against America's engagement into the Vietnam War. Can you just talk to tell me a bit briefly about that? Well, the most impactful, I think, initially was uh, a series of demonstrations against Dow Chemical, who was um, who was producing the napalm in Vietnam, and they they were coming to campus to recruit students to work for them. So there were a series of demonstrations against them, and uh, a number of us decided when um, uh, to to sit in, uh, while many other students decided to pick it so that we had kind of a two pronged series of activities going on. Uh, police came in and acted crazy and um, it became a very big deal uh, on campus and generated a whole mm -hmm. host of activities that included or it continued to expand on uh, sit-ins, I'm sorry, uh, teach-ins and other activities, uh, which I think was pretty impactful and went on past the time that I was there. Uh, also, before I left, was the um, was a black student strike demanding black African American studies at the university, and um, among other things. And I, I was I was part of a group of people that participated and joined that as well. In Madison, there was a group that was formed. Mm -hmm. um, the draft it was a Madison Draft Resistance Union, and then there was also Students for a Democratic Society. They all kind of interacted with each other. So the people who were in the draft resistance union um, started going in the summers to different cities to organize um, in order to be able to create some kind of further communication between students and, um, and communities. And um, out of that, uh, there were groups, several groups of people that went to three different cities to organize. And I joined three of them in Racine, Wisconsin, when I left Madison in 1969. So I was in Racine for several years and we were organizing there. Um, we, we started in the factories, but we ended up doing mostly youth organizing and um, organizing among youth. We also sold Black Panther papers. We also 
uh, got involved in various different issues around health and um, employment and welfare defense and uh, created a pro bono legal program. Really, we got all the, the few lawyers that there were in Racine that we could connect with to do a lot of pro bono work, um, which then became a model for some of the work we did in Chicago afterwards. I moved to Chicago in 1972 to join the group I mentioned earlier. It was called the Intercommunal Survival Committee. Uh, we were a cadre of white activists who, um, uh, uh, who, were, wanted, who, who believed that uh, we couldn't really have a just society unless we had one that was uh, address the issues of racial uh, justice in the country. And, um, and felt that in that regard, the Black Panther Party's 10 point platform and program was right on point. And uh, we were able to have the opportunity to be able to work under their direction, organizing in a community that was predominantly white, our focus was white people and getting them to join the uh, struggle of the black liberation struggle really and the struggle for change under the leadership of black people. So now when you moved to Chicago in 1972, uh, Edison Robo. Uh, he had just been released by the Rhodesian police in 1971 after serving uh, a nine-year jail term without trial. Uh, and then he had initially came to the United States to study in the early 1960s at Tufts University, but then came again uh, as an exiled politician. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about your first experience with Edison. When and how did you, did you see him? We were, in 1975, we began publishing a magazine called Keep Strong Magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was a magazine that focused on the day-to-day -day struggle survivor people initially in Uptown, but, uh, which was the community we were in, but also in c communities uh, throughout the city where people were struggling with the various different issues. So we, um, uh, we covered all of those stories and we also began to um, have a section that we dealt with, uh, with international issues. Uh, and I think early on, probably in 1975, Tapsa Mawari was the uh, was in Chicago at the time um, as an information officer, I think, for Zanu. And mm -hmm. he, we interviewed him, and then he was leaving. He introduced, introduced us to Edison, and that's when we became in touch with Edison. Edison, around the early part of 1976, I believe, uh, approached, came to me, and asked me. If we, we had our own operation, we had a typesetting set, we had a typesetting machine, this was pre-computers, um, and we had, uh, we did layout and design, um, and we had a printer. Uh, we went, you know, we had a relationship with a printer, and he asked if, um, if we would, uh, if I would work with him to produce uh, Zimbabwe News. Uh, for it to be published here and then sent back to uh, ZANU troops in Mozambique, based in Mozambique, to the camps in Mozambique. And I said, sure. So he did all the writing and he provided all the graphics. And um, I would uh, I would do all the typesetting and then we would work together on the design. He'd tell me what he wanted. I would get it done. And then um, he would approve it. And then we would take it, I'd take it to the printer um, and have it done. Uh, so that was really how I got to actually know him much better because I was working with him very closely on these things um, and really through him learned a lot about uh, what was going on um, in the struggle for independence um, and continue to for several years. We, uh, we did, we published, I remember doing three, but I can only find two copies. Mm -hmm. um, but during the last copy that we published, um, we had found a new printer uh, and it was much cheaper. So Edison said, go with them. We were, it was not a printer we were using for Keep Strong, but it was a, wet, it was a, a, um, a, a, uh, a press that was in the basement of a building on the west side of Chicago that um, had on the first floor like a large restaurant and dance hall and had a huge basement underneath and we the the person who I can't remember we found them they probably reached out to me um, said you know we can give you we can give you a really good deal blah 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 we got the pricing it sounded great 
we agreed to go with them. So we got everything done with the, with the magazine. We brought it to be printed. And uh, when I went to pick up the final copy a week later, they were gone. They just disappeared from the face of the earth. Um, and I don't remember all the details, but what I do remember is that we actually found them mm -hmm. and we found them in a small print shop uh, on the north side of Chicago mm -hmm. uh, in a literally a storefront that had a, a single printing press. And, um, and, we made, and we got them to finish printing it. It was, on a, it was not on a web press, it was a much smaller press. So it took a lot longer and it required a lot more binding. It, we went through a lot of different change, but I don't even know how we forced them to do it, but they got it done and we, fin we, got, we got the magazine off. Um, six months after this, I um, read in the newspaper that the that the FBI or some city, some national government, I mean national government department, um, had had a, had closed down the print shop, the same print shop, uh, because they were printing money. So I don't know what their deal was. I have to. I assumed always that they had some relationship to the CIA and were just messing with us, um, but didn't. Or someone had asked them to mess with us. Um, whatever. They were finally caught, though. So I guess they were, whatever their agreement was wasn't great. Uh, but anyway, that was. So we went. So that was sort of traumatic, and we went through all of that. Um, I don't think after that. That was the last one we 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 published. So. Um, I think that they were all printed in 77, 78. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure. And then Edison went to, um, you know, but Edison did, he did some classes for us. We were always doing political education and we also uh, had a school that we connected with um, first with uh, a local college um, and then with uh, a, a Scheimer College and um, we had, at any rate, uh, we had we had classes and um, a local branch. And Edison often came in and and either did, you know, participated in classes or did political education classes with us or did interviews as part of a you know an event um, that we would do. And um, and we kept up on and kept reporting on what was happening uh, with the liberation struggle in Zimbabwe. Uh, it was later that um, anyway, so that that was that was how I originally got to meet him and know him. I want you to tell me about the stories that he wrote that that were published. Some of the stories, but before we get to talk about that, <laughs> what kind of a man was he? Struggle. So he was very uh, committed to the struggle. Mm -hmm. He was very anxious for people to know what was happening in Zimbabwe. Um, he and he spent a lot of time uh, talking about Zimbabwe and what was going on in Southern Africa. Um, he was, uh, I, I, it, it, the, the dynamics that I got from reading the paper and talking to him uh, were very polarized. And, um, and I was, uh, and, and, out, and I sensed a great deal of paranoia uh, from the different part, through him, from the different parties, through the things he wrote and things that he said, uh, so that it seemed um, there was so much repression um, that that seemed to have a really big impact on, um, on, on certainly on Edison and uh, apparently on everybody that was involved um, in the leadership in, um, in ZANU, um, as well as the relationship between ZANU and ZAPO, uh, which were, um, I think, very strained uh, by the dynamics of the situation. Um, so I, I just, um, for me, he was just a very, um, he was like a teacher, really. And, um, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, he when he went to um, when he left Chicago and went and participated in the Lancaster agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what uh, he was, I think he was he was a little disappointed in the outcome. He was happy that there was or he was encouraged. Yes, that there was um, uh, now you know the Zimbabwe was now. Uh, 
the Rhodesia was gone and now we had this new uh, dynamic in Zimbabwe um, and a uh, new leadership, but some of the restraints and particularly the agreement on, um, on land reform didn't really sit very well with him. Uh, so he both saw the opportunities, but he also saw the limitations. And from our conversations, what I really took away from it, not just then, but 10 years later, or in, I didn't get to Zimbabwe till, I got to visit Zimbabwe in 1988, the end of 1988. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was the next time I saw him after he left Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I'd remembered that the land reform was in the original Lancaster agreement was put on hold for 10 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that seemed to me, I've always been very much involved in affordable housing and issues of displacement. Mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to me to be a disaster waiting to happen because clearly what had happened in the country was that the majority of people um, had been removed and their land had been taken from them and they'd been removed from their land. Um, it had been acquired and accumulated by white settlers. And unless there was some redistribution, there was not gonna be any kind of economic equality or economic justice. So waiting 10 years created its own set of, of circumstances that were now, can, now party to the new government, which I, I really agreed could be a real problem. And in 1988, when I visited, it was obvious that this was really coming to a head, that there was a lot of tensions around it, um, all of which not, because people were kind of tired of waiting to see some redistribution, but also um, I think pressured by the, the international dynamics, the dissolution of um, what was coming to, what was clearly coming to pass, the dissolution of the Soviet Union was mm -hmm. kind of, yeah on its way uh -huh. and um, you know the Soviet Union and China and the US had all played a pretty serious game of, of, che of, of chess mm -hmm. with the continent of Africa mm -hmm. and um, continue to do so especially in Southern Africa some of the various different countries in Southern Africa with the South African apartheid regime you know really taking advantage so that you had um, a very complicated situation that was uh, was the, the solution to which was seriously impeded by that clause in the agreement in 1980 in the Lancaster Agreement. I think probably one that is still an issue, still having its consequences in Zimbabwe today, I would guess. Mm -hmm. But I learned of that from, I, that what I know about that, I know from, from Edison. Mm -hmm. When uh, in 88, when I visited, he uh -huh. was, um, he was a minister of, of he was of, a minister oh yeah of legal and parliamentary affairs yeah and yeah. um and so we just spent we were in harare mm -hmm. um prexy had prexy nesbitt had made arrangements for me to also go to uh, mozambique i did mm -hmm. not go to south africa because of apartheid mm -hmm. um but the trip between the time we spent in zimbabwe and the time we spent in mozambique mm -hmm. um especially visiting the um uh, displacement camps and several of the hospitals um, mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. Uh, and it was, I was, um, I, I came back really to Chicago. By then I was an alderman. I came back to Chicago really determined mm -hmm. to um, have some impact on, um, on a, whatever we could do. And it was, so I came back at the end of, so I'm sorry, that was 89. So mm -hmm. I came back at the end of 89 and a month later, it was announced that Nelson Mandela was gonna be released um, from prison. And there was a lot of pressure from South African government on the US government and to um, who, uh, and the, I guess Bush was then the president to, uh, get rid of the or lo loosen the sanctions. Uh, so I joined a campaign in Chicago to strengthen the, the sanctions um, and to do what we could to do it. And um, the, so the role that I played was to um, put more teeth into the sanctions that we had in Chicago as part of a national effort. People were doing the same in, in various cities across the country. Uh, and 
uh, because of the release of Nelson Mandela, this became such a big news story and is talking about coming to the US that it, we were really able to build a lot of support and also just some of the history in Chicago and a lot of the work that the anti-apartheid movement had done. Uh, so uh, we actually, that experience um, actually led to us being able, led to my involvement in the ultimate uh, strengthening of sanctions in Chicago, where really there were three banks that were still in, uh, had investments in South, South Africa. And uh, two of them agreed to um, completely divest within the next six months by the end of the year. And the third um, was going to be barred from um, participating in the city's municipal depository and other uh, things that, and other investments by the city, unless um, they divested as well. So that, and then that was kind of apparently had a little bit of a domino effect on other cities. I think the Port of Oakland proceeded to, to do something very similar after we did it, they were waiting for someone to go first. Uh, so it was kind of a domino effect where it built support for the sanction movement. Uh, we helped build support for the sanction movement, uh, which was really, I think, important uh, in order to force uh, the South African government to do more than just release Nelson Mandela, but actually to end apartheid. Uh, ultimately. Um, so in 91, um, Prexy was having another, organized another trip to, a trip to South Africa. And um, that time I went to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. So when we were in Zimbabwe, I saw Edison again. And by now he was also a minister, but he was in a, he was a different uh, minister. Yeah, he was a minister of mines by then. Okay. Yeah, he okay. was, it was not minister of mines. And he and his wife had returned to their home in province, Mashubo. yes, mm -hmm. and had built some hotels there. So I know we went and stayed in, um, we actually, we wanted to, we wanted to see the ruins that were there. I wanted to see the ruins. We went down there. I don't know, I don't know if it was on the trip or I just convinced Prexy to do it. I can't remember, but because we had a place to stay, he was fine with going down there. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I think that was... That may have been the, the last, last time, time I saw him. Saw. Mm. Yeah. Tell, tell me the, about that. Tell me briefly about that experience. The last time, what kind of conversations were you having? It, because at this point, I'm pretty sure uh, it, it is a point at which he had already started to show his dissatisfaction, uh, not only with what the things that were going wrong as a result of the Lancashire Agreement, but in terms of how the country was being governed. What I took from what he said was that the whole move towards building the hotel and focusing on, on, his, on his home province really was part of him moving away um, and distancing himself uh, from the government. Um, and I think that the idea was that if he could build some wealth and that could be used to impact some of the um, at least in his province, some of the issues uh, that remained from the old regime um, or the, and that weren't being addressed. But um, I don't, I mean, that, that's my impression of my memory. Um, I, he, was, he was clearly a little bit frustrated, but he didn't have a lot of conversation with me about that. So now getting back to the stories, uh, the stories that were published in the Chicago Zanu magazine, just tell me briefly about some of those, an idea of what he was articulating. The, um, there was a lot about the united front between the frontline states. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a lot, you know, we had a lot of, we, the, there, was, there was a lot that we wrote or that he talked about, depending on whatever, mm -hmm. um, about what was going on in um, the role that was, played in Tanzania in terms of that was a meeting place. A lot of people, a lot of things were able to happen in diff different ways in which people were able to both establish United Fronts, but also the dangers of it and the intrigue behind it. So, um, and what, uh, and, and, and the actions taken by both the Rhodesian government and the South African government to undermine uh, the liberation struggle. Uh, I think it was, I think this, I can't remember the name, but there was a group um, later on what we saw in Mozambique where uh, the so South African um, 
military arm had uh, created Renamo uh, in order to who just to destroy villages and to create chaos um, and to just basically murder people. Um, the uh, something similar was had been organized um, in the 70s, 60s mm -hmm. and 70s in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. by the Rhodesian government. I can't remember what it was called. And so there were the ba the bands of people that were, you know, would just go on rampages and attack people and um, and and in a manner that undermined uh, the liberation struggle because they acted like they were part of it uh, to give a bad example of what. To, to scare people and um, make them fearful. So I learned, you know, that so those are some of the things that that I think that we learned about and wanted to make sure people understood what's going on there. Viewers and listeners, uh, this was Mrs. Helen Schiller. Uh, she is a former alderman of the Chicago City Council. She served for six four-year terms from 1987 to 2011. I'm very much happy to have heard you. Have a good day. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.